Morning and despair in Gaza. After 11 days of intense bombing and a tenuous ceasefire, will the renewed diplomatic activity break the political gridlock in Israel and occupied Palestine? Hello, I'm Rida Fakhri. Welcome to the program. Amid a fragile ceasefire in Gaza and ongoing Israeli military raids in occupied East Jerusalem, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken returned to Washington this week after meetings with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas in an effort to achieve the Biden administration's four stated key objectives. First, to demonstrate the commitment of the United States to Israel's security. Second, to start to work uh, toward greater stability and reduce tensions uh, in the West Bank and Jerusalem. Third, to support urgent humanitarian and reconstruction assistance for Gaza to benefit the Palestinian people. And fourth, to continue to rebuild our relationship with the Palestinian people and the Palestinian Authority. Blinken also announced the U.S. will reopen its consulate in Jerusalem, which was closed by Trump, a move of little significance unless Washington withdraws its recognition of Israeli sovereignty over East Jerusalem in line with international law. Blinken also said the U.S. would provide $112 million for the reconstruction of Gaza, bringing the total aid to $360 million. This while the State Department has approved a $735 million sale of weapons to Israel, bypassing congressional approval. Now, with tensions remaining high, the political stalemate in Israel and Palestine continues. A bloc of parties opposed to Netanyahu have until next week to rally support to form a new government. And Abbas has postponed indefinitely legislative and presidential elections he wasn't sure of winning, citing Israel's refusal to allow Palestinians in East Jerusalem to vote. In a few moments, I'll be speaking with former Palestinian Foreign Minister Nasser al-Kidwa and former Israeli Foreign Minister Shlomo Ben-Ami, two prominent critics of their respective leaderships. But we begin in the East Jerusalem neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah, where the forced expulsion of Palestinian families by Israeli settlers sparked the latest crisis. Sheikh Jarrah كانت من المناطق الكتير هادية وكان ما كان فيها مشاكل بالمرة بس بعد اللي عم بيسووه إنه يخلو البيوت بيوت الناس هذا بلشت المشاكل لأنه إنه بيخلوها بدون سبب فهم ما بيعملوا يعني محكمة في بيتنا إنه هلا إحنا بمحاكم بس برضه يعني الشعور كتير يعني سيء لما انت تشعري انه انت هلا في يوم انه رح يعني تروحي من بيتك اللي انت متربيه فيه يعني هلا الشيخ جراح صارت غير امنه يعني حتى انا بتخوني ببيتي يعني هذا بنوصف انه جد صارت مكان غير امن وكمان اه صارت زي بيقعدونا على اعصابنا يعني كل يوم مشاكل كل يوم بصير في قنابل وما بخلونا نعمل شيء على راحتنا ما بخلونا نتحرك براحتنا مجرد ما انا طلعت باب البيت فطوالي من اول ما شافني يعني بدون ما اعمل ولا شيء راح اطلق علي طبعا هذا اعطاني شعور عدم الطمانينه والخوف وفيش امان بطل في امان في في بيتي يعني حتى فانا اطلق علي رصاص مطاطي هذا طبعا طبعا سبب لي كسر في العمود الفقري في الفقره 12 وسبب لي ردود في الرئتين وخلاني اني اصير عندي صعوبه في التنفس وكمان صار عندي بالكسر صعوبه في الحركه طبعا رغم هيك شو ما يعملوا وشو ما يسووا الجيش الاحتلال طبعا احنا رح نضلنا صامدين يعني شو ما انا اطلقوا علي وانا لساتني هذا خلاني بالعكس هذا حفزني انه اضلني انا متمسكه ببيتي وارضي وحي اللي انا عايشه فيه شو ارضي يعني الحي اللي انا ساكنه فيه 
اللي عايشة فيه مع جيراني يعني شو متربية فيه من أنا عمري شو أنا عمري هلأ 16 سنة إلي 16 سنة عايشة هون يعني شيء مش بسهولة يعني هم إنه يطلعوا الواحد من بيته Jana Al Kiswani shot in the back just outside her home in Sheikh Jarrah. The police officer has been suspended after video of the shooting emerged. The Israeli Ministry of Justice says it is investigating the incident. Now, while the Israeli police was using force against Palestinians in the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood, the leadership of the Palestinian government was virtually absent and silent. Joining me now to discuss the state of Palestinian affairs is former Foreign Minister Nasser Al Kidwa. He headed the new independent Al Huria, or Freedom, party to challenge the leadership of Mahmoud Abbas, who's been in office since 2005. Dr. Nasser Al Kidwa, thank you very much for being with me. Uh, what the events in Sheikh Jarrah and in Gaza showed the world is that there is no Palestinian leadership. While Gaza was being pounded by Israel for 11 days, the president of the Palestinian Authority was virtually absent. Hamas filled the vacuum. Israeli governments, over the years succeeded in implementing this divide and rule strategy, and the PA has been left without any power or credibility. Is it time to rethink the leadership and the strategy of the Palestinian liberation movement? Well, it's time to rethink the whole Palestinian internal situation. Uh, we have a situation that needs to be changed, uh, starting with the fact that there is a split between Gaza and the West Bank. Uh, there is a split uh, politically. Uh, there, there is a dysfunctional situation when it comes to the authority it, itself. And uh, recently we have, or they have, cancelled the, the elections, the last democratic feature of uh, that, that uh, authority. So generally we, we need broad and, and uh, uh, deep change, as I called it in the past, and hopefully this is what's going to happen. But what does it look like uh, when you say that there is the need for change? Because you mentioned the split, you mentioned the dysfunction, you also mentioned the elections that Mahmoud Abbas cancelled. You were running on an anti-corruption platform, and there certainly is a lot of endemic corruption within the PA and other Palestinian groups. But shouldn't your priority be a unified front against the occupation? Yes, of course, this is one of, of the priorities. And by the way, we do have, or we did have, and we still have a, a political action program that is a rich one, that is broad and, and covers uh, 25 uh, titles, if you wish, including the uh, internal Palestinian situation, but also including the Palestinian strategy when it comes to the uh, Palestinian-Israeli conflict. So uh, it's comprehensive. Rather than than any narrow uh, narrow uh, narrow uh, action plan, and uh, of course uh, uh, we we need to 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 implement that that program, and it's not going to be easy easy task. Uh, but again, uh, you know the the important thing is to to start. The important thing is to dare the situation and to object to the situation and to try to change the situation. And I think uh, we we did have uh, an, a serious impact on the overall situation. And let me say this: uh, I believe that the, I believe that the real reasons behind the cancellation of the elections is precisely the fact that the deal between Fatah and Hamas did not uh, did not succeed, and the fact that uh, there has been the new list of of the freedom or uh, al hurriya that made it clear that the results will not be the expected ones as it looked at the beginning of the process. Well, yet you talk about having a plan and the importance of starting. But the political elite in Palestine has been around for many, many years, and factionalism has not gotten Palestinians anywhere. Young people are just simply fed up. Mahmoud Abbas has been in power since 2006. His term officially ended in 2009. And it's virtually impossible, let's face it, to hold free and fair elections under occupation. To what extent was his decision, though, uh, to cancel these elections, driven by fear of the real challenge that you and others represent to his continued rule. Well, l l let me let me partially agree with you that under occupation, the, you you can't have free and fair elections. But nevertheless, as long as we have an authority, it's only fair to have elections for that authority, albeit limited elections. But it's a necessity; otherwise, we will end up with a dictatorial uh, regime. 
So uh, having election is 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 a must in in spite of uh, the occupation and uh, irrespective of that of that occupation and its impact. We have to do our best. But who represents the Palestinians today? Because there seems to be a dangerous yes. vacuum. You yourself have been expelled from Fatah after be, you became too vocal and after you called for change at the very top. You even secured the support of Marwan Barghouti, the leading Palestinian figure who's been in an Israeli jail for about 20 years now. Could he be a unifying figure? Is he the unifying figure of the Palestinian struggle? Who is? Well, he is a unifying figure. I think the list, the, the freedom list, generally was a unifying fig figure uh, or, or figures. Uh, the program itself is, is a unifying program. I think substance is, is, very, uh, is very important. And uh, yes, we have done our best. And of course, achieving unity and ending the split uh, appears high on, on our priorities. And that's clear from from our program. And definitely, uh, without it, you can't you can't move forward. The Palestinian people, the Palestinian cause, cannot move forward. So there is no uh, there is no escape of the necessity to do to do this to achieve this and to end to end the results. And actually, now we are again uh, putting forward some ideas, specific ideas. Uh, with ending the, the the split and achieving reunification uh, as number one idea in 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 the whole in the whole package. But hasn't all of this been tried and tested over the years? Do young Palestinians deserve a clean break with the establishment that has embraced Oslo and the two-state solution, and many would argue fell into the trappings of Oslo? Well, I think we are mixing things here because, uh, first of all, uh, without getting into uh, much discussion about about Oslo, let's let's agree that it's it was the Israeli side that cancelled the or abrogated the agreements. So now we uh, we need to deal with the situation in light of of that fact. That's number one. Number two, uh, I think there is nothing wrong with with the two-state solution except maybe the term. The term itself became to be linked with the uh, never-ending uh, negotiations uh, that followed by negotiations that achieved nothing and that proved to be futile. But the national existence of the Palestinian people, the existence of the state of Palestine, albeit under occupation and subject to colonialism, is something that is beyond doubt and something that should not be uh, actually denied. And I believe that the Palestinian struggle should center on achieving national independence, freedom, self-determination, national independence, like any other people around the world. You want to call this two-state solution, fine. If you want to call it something else, it's fine. But, but, but do, you, do you really believe that a two-state solution... Way, Dr. Kidwa, do you still believe that a two-state two solution is an option? Uh, isn't the Arab Peace Initiative as well dead and buried. We saw how several countries have normalized relations with the, with the Israeli government, despite the ongoing occupation. Wasn't the two-state solution a red herring, a, a mirage in many respects that simply distracted from the ongoing settlements uh, and the again, occupation? It, again, it, it depends what you mean by, by two-state solution. If you mean the, the so-called peace process and the endless negotiations, yes, it was red herring. But if you mean the national entity, the Palestinian national entity, national identity, national state, the existence of the state of Palestine, again, albeit under occupation and subject to colonialism, that's a different matter because the Palestinian people is not about to give up on, on, this, on this fact. And by the way, that includes also the young generation because when the young generation asks, what do you think of the peace process? What do you think of the two-state solution? They will tell you no, because he hated the, the so-called peace process. But if you ask him straightforward, what do you think about your national identity? Do you want to have independence in your state of Palestine? Of course, you would get yes and big yes. So I am talking about this. I am talking about my national identity, my national belonging, my national state that needs to be liberated, and we have to achieve national independence. But, but realistically, realistically speaking, though, realistically, realistically, should should you strive towards? A one-state solution, something that Edward Said no, long course, advocated for. No, 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 Israelis and Palestinians not, living under one roof with equal rights for all? There is nothing like that. That's exactly the hoax. That's exactly the hoax. There is nothing like that. What, what that means in reality, 
is erasing 1967 line, ending the applicability of the Four Geneva Convention on the occupied Palestinian territory, making settlements legal, making settlements legal. And that, this is exactly the main goal of the Zionist movement and some liberal Jews, liberal Israelis that advocating that, that, that kind of solution. They are asking me to give up on my identity, on my national rights in return for a promise, very vague promise, for some kind of rights in the future that they will never, they will never materialize. But precisely, Dr. Kidwa, well, under the guise, under the guise Israel of the itself, peace process, under the guise of the continuing peace process and the two-state solution mantra, hasn't Israel done exactly that, which has expanded its settlement uh, building? Let's not, again, let's not confuse the so-called peace process and the two-state solution, the term linked to it, with the Palestinian national rights. That's number one. Number two, yes, the Israelis waged settler colonialism, waged uh, uh, campaigns, uh, campaigns following, campaign each, following each other of oppression against the Palestinian people. Yes, of course, there is no denial of all this. But the, the, the theoretical substitute that speaks of individual rights cancel my national identity for nothing for a promise that will never materialize. And let's remember that even in Israel itself, the Arabs there, the Palestinians there, the, the alikes of Ayman Oda still do not have equal rights. So imagine Jerusalemites and then imagine people like me in Ramallah and other places. That is not going to happen. The only thing that such kind of, of claim would achieve is legitimizing settlements, unfortunately, and playing in the hands of the Israelis. So again, we are not about to give up on our national rights. We are upholding these rights. We are upholding our national goal as the national independence in the state of Palestine. With or without settlements, we are going to wage that struggle. And the Israelis will have no choice but to accept that because it's the logic of history. People will always be victorious and we will always achieve our, our, our national independence and our liberty. Dr. Nasser al-Kidwa, former foreign minister of Palestine, great to have you on the program. Thank you so much for being with us. Pleasure. Meanwhile, in Israel, Netanyahu, who failed to form a coalition government before Israel's assault on Gaza began, faces the prospect of a fifth general election in less than two years if opposition leader Yair Lapid fails to persuade a majority in parliament to rally behind him before June's 2nd deadline. The Israeli prime minister is also facing corruption charges. To discuss the political dynamics in Israel, I'm joined by Shlomo Ben-Ami, Israel's former minister of internal security and former minister of foreign affairs. Shlomo Ben-Ami, it's good to have you on the program. You recently wrote that the violence between Israelis and Palestinians including in Jewish Arab cities, has shattered the consensus among Israelis that Palestinian nationalism had been vanquished. Has it also shattered the consensus among Israelis, especially liberal Israelis, that Netanyahu's right-wing government was ever interested in genuine peace with Palestinians? Well, I think, yes, that uh, liberal Israelis, uh, or the Israeli left, the Israeli diminishing left, one must admit, uh, always saw Netanyahu as somebody who was not interested at all in, uh, in uh, Israeli-Palestinian uh, peace. He sort of invented the concept of peace in exchange for peace. This is what he tried to sell to the Israeli public after the Abraham Accords, after the, the peace agreements, so to speak, between Israel and four Arab countries. He said, you see, I can make peace in exchange for peace and not for land. And uh, that was his philosophy. And this philosophy suddenly collapsed for everybody to see, but for the Israeli right. I think that uh, neutral observers internationally and, uh, and the Israelis from the center to the left uh, understand that his, uh, that his theory, his conception has, uh, has, uh, has collapsed. But, but was it just Netanyahu's theory and conception? Can you blame Israel's decades-long policies of discrimination, of uh, settlement expansion? Can you blame it all uh, on, on Netanyahu and his Likud party? You know, as in life, nuances are extremely important. Sometimes they make the difference. 
it is true, as you say, that Israeli government left and right have been uh, expanding settlements. Even the, the Nobel Pre Peace uh, 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 laureate uh, uh, Itzhak Rabin built settlements or expanded settlements, as it were, or the population of the settlements. Uh, but uh, these governments also try to reach a settlement with the Palestinians. So I think it would be unfair to see all governments as if they behaved uh, in the same way, always just expanding settlements, turning their back to the Palestinian question, etc. But, but that is the reality, though, Mr. Ben-Ami, isn't it? And, and again, the, the settlement being far-reaching from Israel's perspective, not from the Palestinians. But you've called it the end of Israel's illusion. Does it also include the end of the illusion of a two-state solution, that the Palestinians could get a contiguous, viable state as long as these yes, Bantu stands were being created, as long as these settlements were there? This is on the wrong question, if I may. The problem is the political will on both sides, the political capacity to uh, make the necessary uh, compromises and breakthroughs. Uh, the, the settlement issue was soluble and is still soluble. You need to see the maps. You need to see the demographics. It is wrong, both in terms of uh, international uh, law and in terms of morality to continue expanding the settlements. I will be the first to demonstrate against it. But once you sit down to negotiate, there are solutions. Now, they might be much more difficult because under the Netanyahu government, we're talking about 12 years of total indifference to the, to the Palestinian question, uh, things are tougher. This is why many people, I among them, uh, have lost hope in the possibility of uh, reaching a two-state uh, uh, solution again particularly because of the political conditions in Israel and the political conditions in Palestine. You say Netanyahu is an obstacle, but is there any doubt in your mind that Israeli society as well is becoming more radicalized, more right-wing? Is there any real alternative to Netanyahu? The, well, the alternative is not a clear-cut left-wing alternative. We are trying now to form a government which is a mishmash between uh, almost far-right and far left Israel in Israeli terms, uh, with the idea not of really making peace with the Palestinians, but getting greed of Netanyahu. So I think that uh, uh, politically the conditions for a two-state solution, the way we understood it always, seems to me right now not practical, really. I don't see that possible. So do you, do you see a move towards a one-state solution? If uh, Netanyahu and, uh, and the Israeli right continue uh, in power, this is a possibility that might uh, become a reality, not by intention, but, but by osmosis. That is something that might happen by itself. I don't think that uh, the majority of the Israelis um, want a one-state reality. You see, Zionism was more about demography than about territory. And, uh, and uh, uh, the Israeli right changed the equation and made territory into the supreme uh, value, the supreme category for uh, this um, distorted, in my view, distorted view of uh, the original idea of Zionism. Anyway. But, but is Israeli liberalism today at odds with Zionism? Well, you know, Zionism has become a, a contested uh, uh, word in, uh, in, in Israeli life. Uh, the, you know, governments, uh, the parties in, in, in Netanyahu's coalitions have a different view of what Zionism is. And the Israeli left believes that Zionism uh, means uh, withdrawing into or less than 1967 borders allowing the creation of the of the Palestinian state that would live in peace and cooperation with Israel. So these are two different views of uh, what uh, Zionism is all about. Let me, let me ask you this, because even if Israel did move towards a center-led coalition, it will still require right-wing parties. And we know that they control at least 70 
of the 120 parliamentary seats. When you hear members of Congress here in the United States saying that apartheid states cannot be democracies, and you've been hearing the growing criticism of Israeli policies uh, being um, apartheid-like, can Israel be at once an occupier, a Jewish state, and a, a democracy all at the same time? It can't. In my view, it can't. Uh, um, a one-state reality, which is, by the way, supported by them, according to all surveys and research that we know about, supported massively by the younger generation of Palestinians, because they lost any hope in the, in the two-state uh, solution. Uh, I, I am afraid that, uh, however, that uh, one state reality would make Israel uh, definitely a non-democratic and yes, indeed, uh, almost an apartheid state. So I think this is something that should be, that should be fought against politically here and within Israel and that the international community should be also aware of it. And so what happens next? Because can, can you, can Israel continue to maintain the status quo, the occupation, the so-called nation-state law, which gives Jews in Israel the exclusive right to self-determination, the, the illegal settlements, colonies really. Can Israel target and bomb schools, hospitals, civilian infrastructure at will, evict people from their homes, and still call itself a genuine democracy? As I said already, I see that as not only a defiance of uh, international norms, inter international law, I see it as morally uh, uh, wrong. Because, among other reasons, you know why? Because the occupation's practices in the territories do spill over to this side of the, of the green line, of the already deleted or a forgotten green line. And Israel and the territories become uh, one unit in terms of uh, uh, not the practices of occupation, but yes, the, the lack of democratic solidity. So I think that uh, Israel cannot, just to repeat what we said already, cannot be a one Jewish Palestinian state from the Mediterranean to the Jordan River and yet stay demo uh, democratic. I don't believe it can. So, so what do you think needs to happen? Firstly, do you agree with those who say that Israel today is an apartheid state? And second, what needs to happen? No, no, I'm not saying to... that today Israel is an apartheid state. I'm saying that it might become an apartheid state if it becomes, uh, if the occupation is, uh, is, uh, becomes a permanent uh, phenomenon. How do you make sure that the occupation is not a permanent phenomenon? Obviously, we saw the United States, Israel's closest ally, give Israel a blank check. But what kind of pressure will need to be put on Israel for things to change? Would you uh, support calls, as we're hearing now in the Irish parliament from some, to impose sanctions on Israel? What will it take? Well, you know, I will not, uh, I will not uh, advise uh, uh, sanctions on Israel. This is up to different countries to decide what they want. And I'm not going to do, discuss it now. Where will the pressure need to come from, though? Where will the pressure need to come from? From within? It needs to come, it needs to come from inside. And uh, I don't mind, obviously, that uh, the United, uh, if the United States speaks clearly uh, to Israel. I, I think that they should be tougher. I think that they should, be, that they should speak uh, the realities to Israel. And, uh, and try to convey the message that uh, that must be an end to the expansion of settlements and, uh, and, and opening some political horizon that is starting some kind of talks, perhaps an interim agreement of some sort that will right. bring Israel uh, to withdraw from part of the land and dismantle part of the settlements so as to create the conditions for, uh, for a more um, solid, peace process down the road. All right. Shlomo Ben-Ami, Israel's former foreign minister, thank you very much for being with us. Now, for the first time this week, Israel's settlement expansion was described as, quote, de facto annexation by a member state of the European Union.
The Irish Parliament passed a motion condemning Israel's actions on settlement expansion. The Irish Foreign Minister, who supported the motion, condemned Israel's manifestly unequal treatment of Palestinians, while others called Israeli actions in the occupied Palestinian territories illegal land grabs. Joining me now to discuss the significance of this move by the Irish Parliament is Member of Parliament Gino Kenny, who has called for sanctions against Israel. He is a member of the People Before Profit Party. Deputy Kenny, the Irish Parliament has done something that no other European Parliament has done, which is recognize and condemn Israel's de facto annexation of Palestinian land. You've gone one step further, though. You called for sanctions on Israel following its military onslaught on Gaza. How significant is it for Ireland to have taken the lead within the EU? And what are the chances to see sanctions actually imposed? Well, I think it's important, you know, because there is... We have to go beyond words and there has to be deeds and there has to be kind of consequences for Israel's actions, not only in the last couple of weeks, but the last uh, 65, 70 years. Um, because Israel, uh, you know, have, uh, I suppose, have thought of a process that they're not kind of, they're beyond scope of being punished. So it's very, very important, particularly, say, the European Union. Uh, you know, in some ways, um, give sanction to Israel's actions. Because, but why why you know, is it so important, though, for you? Why is it so important for Ireland to do this? Well, I think there's, I mean, obviously Ireland was under occupation for a long, long time. And there is huge empathy in relation to what's going on in Palestine. Uh, and there is huge support in Ireland for, you know, uh, the Palestinian cause. Um, and that's always been the case. So we, we understand, you know, what it feels like to be brutalised and to be occupied and to be marginalised. We understand that. You know, it's in our DNA. Um, and we kind of really kind of sympathise with the Palestinian cause. And it's not just the Palestinian cause. I mean, there's the whole kind of, you know, issue of human rights. Uh, you know, and this is not a religious thing. You know, this is, you know, let's get away from, you know, if it was, you know... Jew and Arab or Muslim or anything like that. This is, you know, at the basis of, you know, the terrible injustice done to the Palestinian people is human rights. Um, and that's the heart of, you know, what we kind of are standing up for. And, you know, them uh, human rights should be, uh, um, you know, it's, it's just so important that them human rights are kind of uh, adhered to uh, related to international law. You say human rights are very important and they need to be adhered to. You also accuse the European Union of hypocrisy, uh, of turning a blind eye to the Israeli aggression. You, you said that the policy of, quote, appeasing apartheid Israel won't work. But the reality is it has and won't it continue to work. Uh, are we likely to see this shift when, as you've mentioned before, the EU has a trade agreement with Israel worth billions yes. of dollars? Billions of dollars. And every single year that trade agreement uh, goes on. Now, uh, Israel is not a normal state. It is an apartheid state. It is a racist state. And if that's the case, uh, and I'm not just saying it, other kind of agencies have said it. Uh, a recent Human Rights Watch uh, in relation to uh, the state of Israel has called it an apartheid state. If that's the case, under international law, under European law, surely we can't stop, we, we will have to stop treating Israel as a normal state. And the least we can do as, you know, as Europeans, at the least, I mean, the very, very least, is to stop normalizing Israel. And in order to do that, you have to sanction Israel, economical sanctions uh, in relation to, you know, uh, it's, it's an ongoing occupation of Palestine. Look, look at the comparison. That, that, happened. Between, like, that happened in the context of South Africa which I think yeah. is the comparison you were going to draw. And Ireland, it's worth remembering, was the first Western country to ban all South African goods during apartheid. South Africa was isolated because of these sanctions, because of the international solidarity movement. The same isn't happening when it comes to Israel. So, so are you going to be able to shake off these deeply entrenched political and economic interests that all European countries have with Israel? Yeah, well, that has to change. You know, I think, you know, Public opinion is way ahead of politicians in relation to, you know, what's going on in the Middle East, particularly uh, in Palestine. And they understand that, you know, Israel cannot 
continuously get away with some of the crimes that is committed. And that's really, really important. There has to be sanction. Um, and if the European Union won't do it, there, there is, like, in, like if, if you want to make a comparison between what happened in South Africa, there was u- a huge swell of opinion, uh, public opinion, against what, you know, South Africa, apartheid South Africa stood for, particularly in the 1980s, the train st- uh, general strikes, uh, boycott, disinvestment. Uh, now, that's what's needed against uh, the state of Israel. And, and, there then- is, and there is a proposed Irish law. That would do just that. The Occupied Territories Bill is exactly. what it's called. It would criminalize yeah. trade uh, with and economic support for illegal Israeli settlements in yeah. territories that are deemed occupied under international law. Yeah. How important is the passage of this bill, which I understand has passed the Senate, which is the lower house? Uh, yeah, so the government are holding the kind of the, that, that bill up. So that bill would uh, basically ban settlement goods uh, that originate in particularly in the West, the West Bank, uh, they would be illegal. Uh, we would like to go much further and to ban all Israeli goods, uh, full stop. Uh, now, the, the kind of the, the kind of the, the scope of that bill, the Occupied Territories bill, uh, it got huge support in Ireland. Uh, but unfortunately, the government at the moment have got quite nervous uh, in relation to the Israeli lobby uh, and also the American uh, US lobby. Uh, they've got quite nervous and they've kind of stalled that process. But I know the, 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 the supporters of that bill want to see it kind of enacted. And we would, you know, we'd be one of the first countries in Europe, actually, the f- yeah, first country in Europe, the European Union, to ban settlement goods. Um, but but in- as you know, there is a, a movement, though, there are many motions in several countries, whether it's in Germany, whether it was in Canada a few years ago, or several other uh, European countries as well, that, uh, n- that almost equate between the BDS movement, the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement against Israel and anti-Semitism. And in many, yeah. in, in many cases, wh- when you single out Israel, you're taken on by the pro-Israel lobby as being anti-Semitic. How, how do you respond to these yeah. accusations? Well, well, that, that's, well, that's a complete smokescreen. You know, anybody that accuses anybody that's fighting for human rights and, you know, and if they equate them to be an anti-Semite, I mean, it's it's ludicrous, absolutely ludicrous. And, you know, the Zionist, the Zionist movement uh, deliberately, you know, tried to confuse the issue between, you know, being pro-Palestinian, being pro-human rights, uh, to being, anti, uh, being an anti-Semite. I mean, it, it's literally ludicrous, absolutely ludicrous. And it's a smokescreen. But relationship. I want to come back to the reality, though, on the ground, because according to the European Commission, the EU is Israel's biggest trade partner, accounting for almost 30% of its trade goods in in 2020. And almost 35% of Israel's imports come from the EU. In fact, last year, the total trade in goods between Israel and the EU was about 31 billion euros. So it's going to be tough for supporters of the BDS movement to change all of this, isn't it? Yeah, it is is tough. I mean, sometimes, you know, when you look what's going on in Palestine, there's kind of, it can feel hopelessness, you know, and that's not just, you know, you look at the situation, it seems kind of almost intractable. Um, but the BDS movement is the cutting edge in relation to uh, isolating Israel and, and holding them to account, because that's the most important thing, and holding them to an account economically, politically, uh, and kind of legally, because if we don't do that, then this generation, you know, will look, will ask, well, what do the generation that has happened, you know, has, you know, has lived through the occupation, what have they done? And this, uh, this generation now has been very politicized because of the Black Lives Matter movement, and they have become very politicized because of the issue uh, of Palestine. And now there's a new, I think there's a new sway, and there's a new kind of I suppose, um, narrative that Israel cannot get away with the crimes they commit on a daily basis. Their occupation is so unacceptable. All right. Gino Kenny, member of the Irish Parliament, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Leading human rights organizations have accused Israel of systemic oppression and institutional discrimination against Palestinians. Human Rights Watch says the Israeli government is guilty of systematically discriminating against and violating the rights of Palestinians 
and that Israel's abusive policies constitute crimes of apartheid and persecution. Last month, the Israeli human rights organization B'Tselem reached a similar conclusion. And earlier this week, France's foreign minister warned of the risk of, quote, long-lasting apartheid if Israel maintains the status quo. Now, five million Palestinians have been displaced or exiled since the State of Israel was established in 1948. Over the past five years alone, the settler population in the occupied West Bank has increased by 17%. In occupied East Jerusalem, a thousand Palestinians are at risk of being dispossessed and forcibly evicted from their homes by right-wing Jewish settlers and Israeli court orders. Land occupied by force by Israeli settlers in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, makes the prospect of a viable Palestinian state virtually impossible. The State of Israel is the only country which has never defined or delineated its international borders. Now, in the US and Europe, governments have warned about a rise in incidents targeting Jews following the attacks on Gaza. In the United States, the Anti-Defamation League reported 193 anti-Jewish hate incidents after the crisis began. And while lawmakers have spoken out against these acts, accusations of anti-Semitism are becoming more widely used to target those who condemn human rights violations by the Israeli government. Here in the US, Democrats have long said their criticisms of the Netanyahu government, which some progressives have described as an apartheid system, should not be labeled as anti-Semitic. This week, four American Democratic lawmakers signed a letter to President Biden saying they, quote, reject comments from members of Congress accusing Israel of being an apartheid state and committing acts of terrorism. These statements are anti-Semitic at their core and contribute to a climate that is hostile to many Jews. Now, many Israeli and Jewish scholars are speaking out against attempts to accuse those with legitimate criticisms of the Israeli government as being anti-Semitic. I'm joined by one of those scholars, Avi Schleim, Professor Emeritus of International Relations at St. Anthony's College, Oxford University. He is the author of The Iron Wall, Israel and the Arab World. <laughs> Professor Schleim, uh, there has been much discussion lately about what is appropriate language to describe Israel's actions, the actions of the Israeli government and its policies against Palestinians. As a longtime scholar of Israel and Palestine, as someone who's also studied the geopolitics of the region, how would you describe the policies of the Netanyahu government in the occupied territories and the reaction that we see in the UK and elsewhere to it? I would describe the policies of the Netanyahu government towards the Palestinians as illegal at every level. Everything Israel does in relation to the Palestinians is illegal and in violation of international law, of international humanitarian law, uh, and of UN resolutions. Israel's annexation of East Jerusalem after the Six-Day War is illegal. The settlements on the West Bank are illegal, every, every one of them. The so-called security wall uh, that Israel is building on the West Bank, which Arabs call the apartheid wall, that is uh, illegal. So Israel is constantly in violation of international law, and all the Palestinians are asking for is the application of international law and the rule of law to Israel-Palestine. You use all of these terms, and coming from you, uh, an Israeli-British historian, it does carry a lot of weight, but there is this almost knee-jerk reaction to label critics of the discriminatory policies of the Israeli government toward Palestinians and the violations of human rights as anti-Semitic. Just how successful have pro-Israel groups and defenders of the Israeli government been at weaponizing the definition of anti-Semitism and deploying it against critics of the Israeli government to silence them? Israel's aggressive defenders have deliberately, and I stress deliberately, conflated anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. These are two completely different categories. Uh, Israel is a sovereign state and anti-Zionism is criticism of the state of Israel and more specifically of its uh, conduct towards the Palestinians. Um, the Jews 
are not a state. They live everywhere around the world. And anti-Semitism is hatred of Jews because they are Jews. Um, the two are completely separate. But Israel and its friends constantly conflate the two, blur the lines between the two, um, in order to silence legitimate criticisms of the state of Israel. But how difficult, though, has it become to redress, to reverse this, as you call it, deliberate conflation that is taking place? Because we saw the vilification of politicians in the UK, where you are, and right here in the United States, uh, politicians who dare to speak out against the Israeli government's policies. In fact, European governments and parliaments have passed motions and resolu resolutions condemning the BDS movement as well as being anti-Semitic. Are we seeing more governments caving in? Or are we seeing the opposite? Uh, we are seeing more and more governments caving in to this pressure to refrain from criticizing Israel. Israel constantly accuses any critic of anti-Semitism. The latest and most striking example is the decision of the chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court to launch an investigation of war crimes in Israel, Palestine. And Benjamin Netanyahu responded instantly by saying the ICC is anti-Semitic. It's nothing of the sort. It's doing its job to carry out an investigation of war crimes. But the pressure on governments and uh, on universities in Britain to adopt the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism is huge. Uh, the Secretary of State for Education in Britain sent in last October a letter to all vice chancellors of British universities insisting that they adopt the uh, IHRA definition of anti-Semitism uh, and threatening to cut off funds to those that did not. So the British government adopted the definition. Um, the Labour Party adopted it. The Conservative Party adopted it. And now there is pressure in universities. And this definition is completely vacuous. How broad is the definition? Because you are one of many Israeli and Jewish scholars who have objected to it. Just how broad is this definition? Um, the definition is two sentences, and it says that um, anti-Semitism is a certain perception of Jews, but it doesn't say what, per what perception of Jews. In Britain, 85 universities have caved in to the pressure from the Secretary of State for Education and signed on to this ridiculous definition. And the real purpose of the IHRA definition is not to protect Jews against anti-Semitism, but to protect Israel against legitimate as well as illegitimate criticism. But yet, though, uh, Professor Schleim, you do have some uh, members of parliament in Europe, like the Irish parliament uh, recently, just this week, moving to condemn what they call the de facto annexation of Palestinian land. It's very few European parliaments have recognized Palestine. Uh, no European governments, I believe, have done so except Sweden. You have called on the British government to right its historic wrongs. What will it take for Britain and others to follow suit? Could, could you... Could you see the day when the United Kingdom would actually recognize Palestine? It's very difficult to say because uh, Britain is responsible for the plight of Palestine. Britain betrayed the Palestinians going back to the Balfour Declaration of 1914. My summary of the history of the British mandate in Palestine is that Britain stole Palestine from the Palestinians and gave it to the Zionists. So Britain, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is made in Britain, and Britain has never accepted its uh, share of the responsibility for the plight of the Palestinians. Uh, Boris Johnson, when he was foreign minister, stated in the House of Commons that Britain will recognize Palestine when the time is right. Um, but 
there's been no recognition. And if now isn't the time, when is the time? And the British policy um, is completely contradictory because Britain supports a two-state solution. A recognition of Palestine is a step towards a two-state solution, but it, it, it would create a more even playing, um, playing field. Professor Avi Schleim, thanks so much. Great to have you on the program. Good to hear your perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Now, it is not the first time that the Israeli military conduct a full-fledged assault on the besieged people of Gaza. It is also not the first time that people around the world demonstrate their sympathy and solidarity with the Palestinian people. But the latest events may be a turning point. In the US Congress, a new wing of younger, more progressive lawmakers is standing up and questioning the US's blind support of what is now often being labeled as an apartheid regime. And maybe more importantly, the decision by the Irish Parliament, supported both by the government and the opposition, to condemn Israel's policies in the occupied territories. History may be repeating itself, as Ireland was the first Western country to impose sanctions on South Africa to end its insidious apartheid system, which in the end came crumbling down in the face of a campaign of steadfast resistance and sustained external pressure. That's all from me, Rida Fakhri, and the entire team here in Washington. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.